Good morning. And welcome all of you today to this uh, worship service. And, and the sharp-eyed among you may have noticed that those are not the right scriptures. Those are last week's. Uh, check the bulletin for the correct ones. Uh, this uh, Sunday, well, after the service, there's a governing board meeting in the former Seekers class, but also at 5 p.m., Calvary Christian Fellowship is inviting everyone through the Ministerial Alliance to a Super Bowl party in their fellowship hall. There'll be snacks there. So if you're just dying to watch the Super Bowl with uh, uh, Christians, that'd be a great, uh, great way to do it. And I can't even remember who's there. Is it the 49ers and somebody? Bengals. Close. The Bengals and the Rams, that's right. I mean, my earliest memory of football was us wanting the Rams to lose to the Cowboys. And then I grew up during the Troy Aikman you know, period, and that was we wanted to see the 49ers lose to the Cowboys. So I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, February 14th, that's just tomorrow. That's Valentine's Day, so I hope that's a good day for all of you who observe it. Uh, Wednesdays, we're continuing our Bible fellowship, looking at the book of Proverbs. And a little further down the line, on February the 26th, that's a Saturday, there'll be a prayer wor workshop with Terry Takel. He is someone that I believe Bishop, the Bishop, uh, outgoing Bishop, especially invited to speak to us at the pastor's retreat or the school for pastors. And he has really inspiring words to say about prayer and how to incorporate them into the life of the church. And that'll be an all-day event down there in Childress. In March the 2nd, it will be Ash Wednesday. Uh, so that's coming up. And then uh, March 6th, the first Sunday of Lent, reminder that the Operation Christmas Child donations, we are receiving them throughout the year, any kind of donations, really. But each month, there's a special focus. So when you're out and about, if you happen to see any accessories, and there's a few pictured there, knickknacks, notions, doodads, extras. Uh, go ahead and pick them up and you can deposit them in the box in the foyer. And that will be our focus in February. Finally, a reminder that our email address is shamrockumc at gmail.com. You can catch worship services if you miss them. They'll be posted on YouTube, uh, maybe less than an hour after we're done here. And you can get audio of the message on our SoundCloud stream and those are both shamrockumc. Again, I do welcome you all to worship. I encourage and invite you to prepare your hearts and minds for worship as we hear the prelude together. Good morning. It's good to be back in our church. So after three weeks missing Sundays, we watched them on Facebook and listened, but it's good to be back in person. So our opening hymn is Marching to Zion. It's on page 733 in your red hymnal. If you'll stand with me, we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Oh, 
in a row. March. <laughs> I invite you to join me in our invocation this morning for help for the forthcoming day. Almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, ordered by your governments, may be always righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our hymn of praise is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. It's on page 526, and we'll sing all three verses. <clears throat> To our time of prayer, I ask if any of you have any joys or concerns that you'd like to share so that we might take them together to the Lord in prayer. That and I have joys. Okay, We Excellent. have Roy and Kim and Daniel and Barbara visiting us today. They came, they're friends of us from our RV sewing group, and they actually are the people who went with us to uh, Dallas-Fort Worth Processing Center to process shoeboxes, so... I got to meet Jared then, and they're just, they're great people, and we're so tickled to have them here this weekend. Very good. Other joys or concerns? Uh, it's very obvious, but uh, the situation in Europe around Ukraine um, uh, is just scary. Uh, it's almost like a prelude to a world war. and rumors of wars. The James Connor family. The Connor family? Mm -hmm. Yes. He passed. Who passed? James. Which Connor passed? Uh, it's uh, James. Gosh. James. 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 Oh, <laughs> Jared, I have an update on Lee. She came through her oral surgery great, and uh, she's resting.
testing today, but she's doing really well. And, uh, praise the Lord. Yeah. yeah. And that was four hours long, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Any other joys or concerns? I have a concern for my cousin still, that Dennis Moore is still not there. Dennis. Yeah. 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 Yes. Pray, pray for my sister, Betty. She's really having a hard time. She was in the car wreck and she's not doing good. Mm -hmm. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Great God of heaven and earth, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you give light to the world. You're the Lord of all nations and the shepherd of our souls. May your light so shine in our present darkness to reassure us, for your light does not flicker or fail and it shines on the path of all who sincerely seek to know you and do your will. Help us always to listen for your voice as we know you listen to our prayers. We ask uh, this morning that you would surround and comfort the James Connor family. That you would surround them with your people and with your presence to bring them healing in a time of loss. We pray for all those who continue to recover from injury or illness. We thank you for Lee's successful surgery and ask that she would quickly heal up. We ask that you would grant Dennis health and wholeness. And please, Lord, sustain and strengthen Betty as she struggles to recover from her wreck. We ask that you would be with Hazel and with all uh, this morning, who are maybe feeling a little bit run down. We thank you for um, Roy and Kim and Daniel and Barbara and for this opportunity to worship with them. We ask that you would, as we know you already are, uh, maintain your hand on events around the world, especially uh, the alarm that we have been given or told to have over what is happening in Europe. We know we have a king whose kingdom cannot be touched, but nevertheless, we do quake when we see the kingdoms of this world shake because we live in them and we love the people who are in them. Continue to uh, watch over this world and help us to see clearly your hand at work so that we may busy ourselves with what you are doing and not be led astray into fears that can paralyze us. And help us to return the love you have shown us, for you have loved us first and best. May we always remember that Christ is our one true shepherd. With this thought, guard our hearts against seeking or being lured towards greener pastures in the flimsy and false promises of the world. It's running after wealth and success and power and reputation and comfort. Teach our hearts to be satisfied with the green pastures where the spirit of Christ who shepherds us has led us and may your rod and your staff rule over our troubled souls, healing the wounds of the past, calming our present fears and relieving our worries for the future. All this we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
our hymn of preparation is How Firm a Foundation. On page 529 in your red hymnal, we'll sing verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. If you'll stand with me, please. <laughs> Testament reading is Psalms 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither, and all that they do they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. Our gospel reading is Luke 6, 17 through 26. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all over Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured, and all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out of him and healed all of them. And then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you who, when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. And woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
This is Luke's version, some people might say it that way, of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, He tells it a little differently, and we shouldn't let that bother us, because what's important is what both Matthew and Luke are saying is actually going on here. Uh, Matthew calls it when he's up on a mountain. Here, he's actually on his way down from the mountain, and he stops at a level place. Luke was very big on Uh, making it clear in his gospel from the Song of Mary and the Song of Zechariah that God is going to lift up the lowly and bring down the proud. He's going to make things level. He's going to put all things under his feet. Now, what was Jesus doing on the mountain? Luke tells us that he had been up there. He'd been praying all night. And after he was done praying, he had picked 12 among his disciples. 12, that's where he picked the 12. And he's on a mountain and he's teaching them. He's giving them the law again, as it were. This is a new Sinai, it's a repeat, it's a signal that God is finally going to regather his people, not as he did with a covenant at Sinai, that was where Israel actually was formed. They were just in Egypt as slaves and he brought them out to the mountain where they agreed to be his people And he agreed to be their God, and they promised to keep his laws. Hence, the importance, as Psalm 1 says, of happy are those who don't follow or walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the path of sinners or tread in the path of sinners or sit in the seat of the scornful. Their delight is in the the law, the teaching of the Lord. And on that, they meditate day and night. Those are the ones who are like trees planted besides a river, never gonna feel a drought, that tree. And in all they do, they'll prosper, their leaves won't wither in their fruit, and their season, they're going to bear fruit. And here we have Jesus clearly redoing that, 12 disciples for the 12 tribes. And they're listening to what he says. This importance of listening to what God says as being the very defining characteristic of his people has not changed. It was that from the beginning. It was that for Abraham who believed what the Lord said to him and that was reckoned as righteousness. And so too for the people of Israel, so too for the disciples because they listened to him. And this is reiterated again on the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus is revealed in his glory. And the voice from heaven says, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. Now, we should pay careful attention to how this is set up because Luke is pretty clear. uh, There's a lot of people that gather from all over and they've come to be healed, but also to listen to what he has to say. But we're told before Jesus says, he looked up at his disciples and said. So he's talking to them. He's telling this news about what the kingdom will be like, what they have to look forward to because they're already with him. And the crowd is watching this happen. The same thing was set up in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. Those people aren't excluded, but they're watching the kingdom as it were from the outside, and they're welcome to come in, as they will soon learn, if they too will listen and follow. And what he says to them is interesting because it contains not just blessings, blessed are the poor and those who mourn and the hungry, but also woes. Now, I don't know, this is why I say it doesn't really matter that there's a a little bit of teaching here and a lot in Matthew, because the message is simple. Jesus is the one, the prophet like Moses. He's also the son of David. He's acting in a kingly way. He's the fulfillment of all that stuff in the Old Testament, not just the stuff about Messiah, the anointed one, but also the servant, the son of David, the branch of Jesse, all that. And this is where the teaching goes. And pretty much Matthew gives us the whole caboodle and Luke gives us this sort of snapshot of blessings and woes. So this is good news, but it's not good news for the wealthy, for the rich. I'm gonna start with the woes since that's unique. He's saying that if you're rich, if you're powerful, it pretty much means the same thing this isn't necessarily good news. And also, he says the people who are full, 
Well, I don't think it just means food. I think he means the people who are satisfied, the people who are comfortable, the people who are, you know, they're satisfied with the things they are. He says they're going to wind up being empty. And this notion of the people who laugh, that's a little bit elusive. This kind of laughter, it's a specific kind. We just have kind of one word. We have giggle and we have... But we don't distinguish between different kinds of laughter the way they did. This is the laughter that comes from, say, after a victory. You're laughing over an enemy. Or you're laughing in mockery, like those who sit in the seat of the scornful. So here it would represent those who aren't just triumphant, who are successful in life, they gloat. Uh, these are the ones who don't listen to the proverb that uh, those who mock the poor dishonor their maker. Uh, they don't understand that. But whoever, whoever, at this point counts themselves a success, this will not be true later on. And finally, if everybody's speaking good of you, those who, who value being respected or having a good position in society, now, is this always true? I think he was living at a time, of course, we know when things just weren't very good, and the people were realizing it, the temple authorities were corrupt, the Romans weren't any better, and if these zealots had been successful in their revolution, they probably would have been the worst of all. And let's face it, isn't that the case? In times where corruption is rife and the powerful are abusing the people, you're not going for long to be rich, to be respected, to be comfortable, to have all people like you. That won't last. In fact, that's how you'll be pressured to compromise on what we think the Lord has told us. It's for those things that we do count as blessings. Those the woes are addressed to those who have everything that we ordinarily count as blessings that we hope for ourselves, for our friends, our families, to have prosperity, to succeed in what we do, to be fruitful with our lives, to be those who are honored for such, and to be those, just all this is good stuff. So what Jesus is doing in this, this contrast and this reversal, he's really talking about the day of the Lord, about the judgment of God that comes from time to time, not just on the last day, but that indeed came on Israel time and again when they refused to listen to the Lord. They refused to respect him. And so he plucked them up and sent them to Babylon. And now Jesus is announcing to those who are gathered around him, the kingdom has come and you're a part of it, and he's giving them a heads up. For a while, you're gonna mourn. For a while, people will speak ill of you. For a while, you'll be hungry, and not just for food. And for a while, you'll be poor. But I think the most haunting of all, of the woes that he speaks, is woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. You have what you want. If you count yourselves rich, it means you already have what you want. And he realizes, looking around at not just the lost people, but the leaders and the great, they don't have the Lord. They have no idea who he is. They have twisted their understanding of God to incorporate their idols, just the way that any society or culture can twist its values, or rather not twist its values, but twist the scripture to fit its values. The people who are satisfied aren't looking for anything else. They won't want what Jesus has to offer. Especially since he's telling his disciples that what they look forward to is not the things that the nations and your average person craves. He's warning them, you may face persecution. But this juxtaposition of the blessings and the woes is a reminder to them that God's justice is coming. Who's laughing now? It doesn't matter because God will have the last laugh. This first blessing, blessed are you who are poor for yours is the kingdom of God. Is there something meritorious about being poor? I hear some people talk as though that's the case. 
Well, again, in a time of great corruption, most of the good meritorious people are gonna be among the poor. But no, he's talking to his disciples. They've left everything to follow him. They don't know whether they're gonna get a chance to go back to it. No, there's nothing particularly meritorious in being poor. God simply chooses the poor, he chooses the weak, he chooses the contemptible to bring to nothing the things that the world respects, the things that it idolizes, that even if it doesn't lift up above God, tries to set side by side with him. This is something that we don't understand about idolatry. God is good, nothing else is. It's very easy to have God be the greatest good alongside other lesser goods. You will have no other God before me. God is the source of every good. And whenever our hearts are distracted, whenever our, our love for God is weakened by the love we have for other things that we imagine as goods existing alongside God, our hearts are falling prey to the same sort of weakness that Israel's idolatry made it prey to. Paul writes to the Corinthians in the first chapter of his letter, now this is a wealthy town. This is where a whole bunch of trade goes through. They don't wanna have to sail all the way around the coast of southern Greece. They would bring their uh, merchandise across the narrow isthmus of Corinth and then just bring it right through a nice quiet gulf and move on towards Italy. They were rich like Hong Kong. And they were also proud and they assumed that they were wonderful people and Paul writes to them at the beginning of his letter in 1 Corinthians 1 verses 27 to 29, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are. He chose the things that the world regards as nothing, as worthless, to bring to nothing the things that it values. He does this so that no one, or as Paul writes, no flesh, might boast in the presence of God. God chooses the poor in order to expose that nothing that we really count wise, wonderful, or strong really is in comparison to God who alone has being in and of himself, who alone is essentially good. Everything else is a vessel. Wealth is good or bad depending on how you use it. Reputation is good or bad depending on who is praising you. All these other things are just vessels. As it happens, I've been reading through Jeremiah. It's the latest part of the Bible I'm reading through. And it makes me think of this idea of a people uh, walking towards judgment with no idea it's happening. But in one part, Jeremiah writes in chapter 27, five, it is I who by my great power and my arts outstretched arm have made the earth with the people and animals that are on the earth and I give it to whomever I please. In that instance, he was gonna give it for a while to Nebuchadnezzar, but he gives it to whomever he pleases. Isaiah 40, 23 describes God as sitting over the earth, uh, the circle of the earth and seeing the human beings on it like grasshoppers. He who stretches out the heavens like a tent and he brings princes to naught and makes the ruling, the rulers of the earth as nothing. To show them, to remind them for their good who is in charge, that there is a God. He does see what they're doing. He does know what's going on. And if they're laughing now, they should know that he will have the last laugh. This is an important distinction that we see at the beginning of the book of Psalms. The individual is reminded, you must treasure the word of God in your heart. That will be your true source of prosperity, the only prosperity that'll ever be worth having. But the very next Psalm, chapter two, or Psalm two says, why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds asunder and cast off their cords from us. Isn't that the way most people who have no respect for God imagine 
the teachings of the Lord. Well, that's just there to take the fun out of the life. You squelch the joy out of everything. And he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord has them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Here Jesus is coming forward as a king, and that's his version of wrath and fury. He will rule, and you won't. You who laugh now at the idea of God will not be laughing later. The laughter that you have turned out will be turned back against you. But God is the maker of all things and he gives to whomever he pleases. So that's the real possibility. Why are the poor going to get the kingdom of God? Well, just because he decided to give it to them. There may not be any point at all in trying to figure out what's so wonderful about the poor or ennobling them. They're no better than any of the rest of us. They're simply the ones that God has chosen in order to show that we have put our trust in the wrong things. It sounds a lot like that too in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. It directly parallels this idea of woe to the rich and blessed are the, uh, are the poor. Lazarus, if you remember, wasn't, this is not the brother of Mary and Martha, but he was a poor beggar who sat outside uh, the residence at the gates of the house of a very rich man. Sometimes he used to be called Dives, but that's just, that just means rich. I love that. Scripture remembers Lazarus. He gets a name. The rich guy doesn't have any identity, just his wealth. That's what he thought made him who he was. And Lazarus would sit out there and the dogs would lick his wounds and he would crave, just wish, long for the crumbs that would fall from the rich man's table. Implication, they're not even giving him the leftovers. He's getting nothing from them. Well, they both die and in Jesus' parable, Lazarus goes to the bosom of Abraham and the rich man goes to a place of torment. And the words of Abraham to the, to the rich man are this, child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus in a like manner evil things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. He had received his reward. That's all he wanted. He wasn't looking for anything more, and so he received nothing more. But God seems to sense in this passage, as Jesus tells it, that he will pay back the people who got a raw deal with something much better, as long as their souls aren't tempted. Because that is what causes us to walk in the counsel of wicked and tread in the path of sinners and sit in the seat of scornful, it's all those goodies. Rich, richness, success, reputation, power. That's what tempts us aside. And I think there is, a, again, the subtle clue in that he longed for the crumbs from his table. It means he didn't steal them. He didn't take them away. And I don't think his heart was full of resentment. This is even more clear in the parable of the prodigal son. If you remember, he's feeding the pods to the pigs and he longed to eat it? Well, if he would just eat it, but they would, didn't belong to him. He wouldn't even steal the, pot, the pig's food to feed himself. So something in his heart, we see, thou shalt not steal. There was a word in his heart that stuck, even in the worst of times. And I would submit that there's hints enough that the same thing was true of Lazarus. The reason I was thinking of Jeremiah is because just looking at just some of the stuff that's been happening for the last two years, and I'll just mention one thing about it. Some of the policies we've had have absolutely been wicked. They just came out with a study in Johns Hopkins, uh, Johns Hopkins did, that showed that all of the steps they did, the lockdowns, mandates, all that, they can find absolutely zero statistical evidence that it had any ultimate effect. Zero, 0.2%, I think, nothing. Well, it did have some effect. It certainly hurt the poor. Uh, we know that uh, 
in fact, they're right. It did help some people. Um, if you look at a breakdown of who actually wound up dying in the last two years, the people in the laptop class who could lock down, order in their groceries, they did pretty good. About a third as many of them died as the essential workers, the people who were driving around delivering the groceries, the people who were keeping the trains running on time, the people that were essential. They about died at about a number of three times. And of course, the poor, the people who are part of the informal economy, they can't just stay at home. They live hand to mouth day by day from connections. They have to go out. I think one of the worst things I heard was a fellow pastor who's in New Mexico was describing how Gallup, New Mexico, was going to shut down the entire city. Well, just for the weekend. I thought, well, what is that supposed to do? Now, she said, no, no, no. They're not going to actually shut down the stores in the city. They're just going to blockade it so nobody can come in and out of it. Well, again, what good would that do? Well, it's the first Sunday of the month. The Native Americans on the reservations have just gotten their relief check. This is when they would come into town, cash them, and resupply. I thought, really? In this day and age, with all the virtue signaling and the posturing, they don't want those dirty Native Americans and their dirty germs to come into their nice, clean city, even though they need to resupply. Oh, but it gets worse. It gets worse. For us, it's not so bad. We can shut down for a while, but what about in this globalized economy, what about the nations further downstream of our economies? We shut down, we print money. Sure, there's a little inflation, we devalue the savings, we leave our kids with higher taxes, but we do fine. The people who were depending on our economies, living downstream of them, downstream of them were actually, many of them, reduced to starvation by the economic dislocation. Economists have estimated that already a quarter of a million children died in Southeast Asia because of that economic dislocation. And what have we done to our own children? They who weren't even at risk, denied an education, denied emotional development by not even being able to see emotions expressed on faces, and it just keeps going. I see a nation that has ground the face of the poor. That, in that sense, some of the measures they took were very successful. They shifted the burden of what was happening from the wealthy to the poor. They are doing exactly what God said he would not overlook. Now, the real message of Jeremiah is understanding the signs of the times. See, he gets two visions when he's wondering, what are we to do about this people? The first time around, God sends him to a potter's house. And he goes and he watches the potter making a pot. He throws the clay on the wheel, and the pot goes wrong. The lip throws off or it tears. If you've ever seen a pot go wrong on a wheel that's spinning, you know that that can happen. And as he watched, the potter picked up the clay, put it together, and threw it on the wheel again and started over. And Paul said to Jeremiah, do I not have the right to do this with Israel? Well, that's encouraging. So in times of upset, he's perfectly willing to remold his people and to shape them again into a vessel for his service and his use. That's promising. As time went by, uh, in, there was parts, it's hard to tell if Jeremiah or the Lord is speaking or both. He wishes that his head were a fountain and his eyes a river so that he could weep all day long for the daughter of my people. Well, he changes his tone when he discovers that there were people plotting against him. They said to themselves, we don't have to listen to Jeremiah anymore. Let's uh, attack him with our tongues. Let's bring false charges against him. Let's destroy his reputation. We'll still have prophets and priests the ones that they loved to hear, that they spoke well of, that Jesus was talking about. We'll still have them, but we won't have to listen to him anymore. Eventually, they threw him into a well of mud. Well, after he learned about that, he suddenly, he's not really praying so much for them. He's praying that God would let them have it. Well, God gave him another vision or another lesson to show to the people. He said, I want you to take a clay pot and smash it in front of the people and say, so shall I do to Israel. So, are we wet clay or are we a fired pot? 
That's kind of the question. Jeremiah never gave up. At one point, he was commanded to write down all the things that he had, the warnings he was trying to give, and he said, give it to Baruch and have him read it in the presence of the people when they come to the temple. And they heard it, and they were alarmed. It sounded like they were listening. And some of the king's servants heard it as well, and they were alarmed, and they told King Jehoiakim about it. And he said, bring him in. Bring it in. So they brought in the scroll to the king. Baruch and Jeremiah, meanwhile, they said, hide out. Anyone who wanted to to actually speak what God wanted the people to hear was in actual danger. Not just their jobs or their reputation. And they took the scroll into the king, and every time they would read a few columns, he would calmly take his penknife, cut it off, and throw it into the fire. It sounds to me like he's experiencing a ruler or a leadership where the cries of the poor and the people who want a little justice are falling on deaf ears. And I just keep thinking about that. And then I remember to step away from that world, to remember that we've been invited in, that we're after the cross and after the resurrection. We are his disciples. We're gathered here today. We're listening to his word. And his word is to us, blessed are you who are poor. And blessed are you who see this and mourn. And you'll laugh one day. Because the king of kings assures you. Psalm 37 says this, do not fret because of the wicked. That's hard to do. As often as we're bombarded with all the bad stuff. But it's very clear. Do not fret because of the wicked. Don't be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good so that you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. There's the key. Delight in the Lord. Delight in what he says. Once we truly love him with our, all our heart, mind, and soul, it's suddenly safe to give us all the other blessings because our heart can no longer be stolen by them. We see where our true blessing lies. It is in belonging to God. It's in him being our true eternal portion. When the Lord is our greatest treasure, the, the lesser treasures can no longer steal our hearts. And when our treasure is in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God, Truly, Christ will reign in our hearts, and we will reign with him forever. I will close with this. As we are here as his disciples, this is a great message from Luke, and it's becoming more and more important to me as the days go by. It's Luke 12, 32. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do not be afraid, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You're going to get it because he chose to give it to you. And his word, once gone out, will have its effect. It will not return to him empty. Don't be bamboozled, misled, discouraged in any way. He's going to give you the kingdom. Amen. At this time, I remind you that the offering plates are at the rear of the sanctuary on either side of the central uh, aisle. And before we sing the doxology, I invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Almighty God and most gracious Father, thank you for being our God. We ask that you would uh, continue to bless us with a vision of your glory. You who give us such beauty in the world and also such love in Christ. We ask that you would now bless uh, these offerings from what you have given us. Use it as you see fit for your kingdom that others might listen to you, might ignore the false and misleading voices of the rulers of this world and come to the still small voice of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who is able to truly and forever lift them up. For the privilege and the honor and the joy of being your people, we give you thanks in the name of Jesus Christ.
in whose name we also pray and live. Amen. Lifted up in your lives. May your eyes be opened, your minds enlightened, and your hearts at peace as you depart from this place. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do not be afraid. And may Christ, who has overcome the world, give you strength and courage to face and overcome every obstacle before you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh, God.